2 Samuel 7, that's where we are today, 2 Samuel 7, I am so pumped that I am like shaking because I am so excited about this text. Um, 2 Samuel 7, starting in verse 1, uh, I'm going to read to verse 16 right here at the beginning. We'll talk about a little bit more than those 16 verses, uh, but I'm going to read the first 16 verses out of 2 Samuel 7. And it should be on the screen as well, but if you have a copy of your own scripture, I'd encourage you to follow along there. I am reading out of the ESV. It says, Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought you up, I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel? saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, but with the stripes of sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So listen, we've been in this series for a while, and we have finally made it. You're like, okay, where have we made it? Is the series ending today? No, series is not ending today. What we just read is one of the most crucial and important moments in all of your Bible. I mean, top five, maybe, moments in all of scripture. This chapter, 2 Samuel 7, unlocks and connects what has happened in your Bible before this, what is about to happen throughout the rest of the Old Testament, and what unfolds in the New Testament. This chapter is proof that our Bible has one author. It's one full, complete story, that it is one truth that goes from Genesis to Revelation, that what we will see today is that to understand Jesus and the gospel, you have to understand what happens here with David. Do you know what title Jesus is given most in the gospels? More than any other title, he is called the son of David. Matthew will use this title 10 times in his gospel alone. And so this chapter is so important that we understand What's happening? So here's what I want to do today. I hope you have noticed by now that most of the moments that we have covered in this series have layers to them. Have you noticed that? The different layers in these moments. First, there is the layer of the immediate impact. What is happening in that exact moment that we are reading and how it impacts David and those around him? And there are lots of things, if we just focused on that, there are lots of things that we could learn about who God is and who we are as human beings, these practical moments. But then there is this second layer where God is telling a bigger truth that goes beyond the immediate impact of that 
moment that God is over and over pointing forward. Something is coming. I'm going to restore all things. And the reality is, if we can understand the big picture of what God is doing, the perfect plan of God, it's going to make it easier for us to trust God in the immediate moments of our lives. So today, we're going to look at those two layers, and we're going to dial in on them. And so first, we're going to look at what is specifically happening with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and what we can learn from that encounter. But then we're going to expose this second layer that has massive implications, not just practically, but as to how we are to think about the grand, eternal plan of God. So, for you note takers, when you think about these two layers, if you want a single phrase that summarizes this first layer, it's this. God has a better plan for your life than you do. God has a better plan for your life than you do. Most of you have probably heard the phrase before, um, man plans and God what? Laughs. Man plans and God laughs. It's from an old Yiddish expression. Maybe you've heard of the offshoot of the phrase. If you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans, right? And here's the truth. We all make plans. We all have expectations. If there's anything true about Western culture, it is that everyone has a plan for their life, even if it looks like you don't. Even if your life looks like a mess, right? Which is probably would describe all of my 20s. Even if your life looks like a mess, the reality is somewhere in the back of your mind, you do have some kind of plan for your life. For your life. You have expectations for how you think the future is going to go. When I worked with college students, um, I would meet with every senior at the beginning of their senior year, and the co- most common question to ask a senior is, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? And so I would ask them that question, and they would have one of two responses. The first response was something like, um, I don't know, get a job. And the other response was, I have no idea. There are these super overachievers, like this 1% of students, that would walk in and they would have like a 20-point power presentation, and it always ended with them taking over the world. But that was not the norm. All right? Maybe that's some of you, okay? Um, but most of these seniors had no kind of practical plan for what was next in their lives. And so I eventually changed the way I asked the question. Instead, I would say, okay, describe your life in 15 years. And then I would ask them questions like, okay, Are you married in 15 years? Do you have kids? How many kids do you have? What kind of job do you have? Are you in an apartment? Do you live in a house? Do you live in the city? Do you live in the country? And as we got further and further into these questions, the light bulb would go off in their heads. Oh, I I do have a plan. I, I do have expectations for what my life is going to look like. So the question then becomes, okay, how do I get from here to there? And so if I asked you, all of you in here, What does your life look like in 15 years? Are you living in the same house? Are you living in a different house? If you're in an apartment, are you in a house? If you're single, are you married? If you're married, what is your relationship with your spouse like in 15 years? What do you want it to be like? Do you want it to be the same as it is now? Or do you want it to be different? If you're in the workplace, do you still have the same job that you have now? Or do you have a different job? For those that have kids, What are your kids like in 15 years? Are they in high school, in college? Are they married? Do they have their own kids? What is your relationship with your kids like in 15 years? See, even if we don't realize it, we have expectations. We have plans for how we think our life is going to go. You may not know how you're going to get from A to B, even if your map, the map of your life that is in your head is drawn in crowns, and it has scribbles all over it, there's still a map there. And at this point in David's life, when he sits in his palace, there are no more battles to fight. So what does he do? He begins to plan. He begins to draw up expectations. So he sits comfortably in his palace. And then verse 1, it says, The king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. And the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar. But the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now let me say something. Is it wrong to make plans for your life? No, not at all. People are making plans all over the Bible, right? Don't be afraid to plan out the future. But it's important to ask questions like, okay, does this violate scripture in any way? 
Do my plans glorify God and join him in his mission to make disciples of all nations? If they do, great, make a plan. And here we see David make a plan and the prophet Nathan says, great, do all that is in your heart. God is with you. See, I say that because sometimes we paralyze ourselves waiting for some sort of special calling from the Lord. We sit around and we wait. God, can I eat now? Can I go do this now? And we sit and we sit and we sit And God's already told you what to do in his word. So if you don't have any kind of special calling from the Lord, you need to know that's okay. If your heart is in step with the purposes of God, then do what is in your heart. That's what David does. David has done all that God has commanded him to do at this point, and God has given him rest from his enemies. And so as David sits in his palace, I can imagine his eyes fell on the tabernacle. The tabernacle was basically just a giant tent that housed the Ark of the Covenant, and God had given instructions for how it was to be constructed all the way back in Exodus. It's been several hundred years at this point, so I can only assume that it looked pretty shabby. And as David looks around in his massive palace, he says, you know, this isn't right. God lives in a beat-down tent, and I live in a house built of cedar, which was like the luxury of all luxuries. And so David makes a plan. I want to build God a new house. And so David goes to bed. I imagine him just giddy, so excited about his plan. And then the Lord comes to Nathan. And I'm going to read out of 1 Chronicles 17.3, which retells this story. But it says, but that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, it is not you who will build me a house to dwell in. So is it okay to make plans for the future? Yeah, you bet it is. As long as you understand that God has the right to reject your plans. And this is what we have a hard time with. We hold on so tightly to the plans that we have made that when God comes and tries to remove those plans from us, we strengthen our grip and tell him to get out of here. And the deep soul issue is that we have a trust issue and we have a position issue. We don't trust him and we don't understand where we are on the pecking order because the irony is the thing that we easily forget is that God can do whatever he wants with our lives. He can do whatever he wants. Doesn't matter if we loosen our grip or not. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man. You've got many plans, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. That God does whatever he wants, whether we like it or not. not. And for some of you, you're sitting there right now and you're like, yes, Colton, give me more of this truth. Give me more of the sovereignty of God that he's in control. Give me more, give me more. Some of you are so excited. And then for others, you want to swat those words out of your face like it's a fly that lands on your nose. You're just like, get out of here. I want to be in control. And the truth, at the end of the day, is that God has plans for his name's glory. And yes, they include you. And he will accomplish them. And, but we fight so hard against them. God essentially tells David, David, I appreciate the thought. But in all those years I was leading, I was providing, I was ruling, I was leading Israel. Did I ever ask anyone to build me a house? He says, David, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Look at verse 8. He says, Therefore, you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. He reminds David, hey David, everything that has happened in your life has been because of me. That was my plan. And then in verse 9, he says, I have been with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you. God even takes credit for David's victories in battle. He says, I'll make you a great name, like the name of the great ones in the earth. And then in verse 11, he says, it's not you that's building me a house, David. And here's essentially what he says, David, instead, I am building a kingdom through you. So here's the question. In this scenario, who is the giver and who is the receiver? God is the one giving to David. David is not giving anything to God. Let's think about this. David did not choose God. He didn't determine the plans of God. God laid out the plans. God executed the plans, and he chose who he would use to fulfill those plans. Essentially, God says, look, David, you have it all wrong. You are not the author of this story. It's not you that's going to build a house for me, but I'm going to build a house through you in my 
name. And David, my plan is better than your plan. David, you want to build a house. I want to establish my house forever. You are building something that's temporary, but David, I am building something that is going to last for eternity. I can imagine that there are two groups of people in this room. The first group is a group of people that could not have imagined in a million years that God would have led you to where you are right now. That there have been many testing moments in your life, moments that did not play out like you thought that they would, right? But as you look, where has, as you look around at where God has brought you, you rejoice because you see how the plan of God has unfolded. And now when you think about your life, you look to him with gratitude. Your trust in him is stronger. Your devotion to him is deeper. And now you are thankful that he is the one planning out your life and not you. And then there are others in this room who feel the weight of a failed plan. You feel the weight of a failed plan. You had a plan for your career and it did not play out like you thought it would. You had a plan for your marriage, for your family, and it has not played out like you thought that it would. If I could graciously remind you, and if you ask those in that first group, they'll tell you, if I could graciously remind you and encourage you, trust in the plan of God. His plan is better than your plan. And for David here, God exposes the plan to him, and it's better than any plan he could have imagined. And this is where we see our second layer. David says, I'm going to build a house for you, God, a physical place for you to dwell in. And God says, no, David, I don't need a house. I'm building a kingdom. And he tells him, I'm going to do this through one of your sons. In verse 12, he says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom." He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So here's the question. Which son is he talking about here? Which son of David? And here's where you see the two layers, okay? This prophecy has a double fulfillment. There is the immediate fulfillment, which has an impact on the people in this story, in this moment. But then there is an eternal fulfillment. The immediate fulfillment came through David's son, Solomon. Solomon would be the one to build the temple that David wanted to build. And Israel, under Solomon, would have success like it had never had before. And like it never would again. But as you read through Solomon's story, it becomes obvious that Solomon turned out to be pretty disappointing. I'm not going to go into all of it, all the kids in here. But Solomon had more wives than basically any other human being in history. Um, He started to worship foreign idols. Solomon's going to make a lot of mistakes. So it becomes obvious that he's not the one that is going to be established on the throne forever. So these words from God in 2 Samuel 7 point to another son in the line of David. This moment in 2 Samuel 7 is known as the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. That God is making a covenant to David. Circle that word forever in verse 13. Circle it there in verse 13, and then look at verses 16, 24, 25, 26, and 29. You see that word forever. That God is promising something here in 2 Samuel 7 that is going to last forever. So we have to ask the question, okay, what is God promising? In order to, in, in order to understand that, we have to understand what has happened before this, and how this all fits within the grand story of God. So if you'll walk with me, and if you're a note taker, I want to apologize in advance, okay? Because we're going to move fast. Um, There are four covenants that happen in the, there are more covenants than that, but there are four specifically that I want to mention today. God makes a covenant with his people four different times. The first one is known as the Noahic covenant. That's the covenant with Noah in Genesis. By the time we get to Noah in Genesis 6, sin has enveloped the whole world. In response, God sends a flood, making a way for a restored creation that will begin with Noah and his family. So God enters a formal relationship with Noah and all living creatures, promising that despite humanity's corruption, he will never again flood the earth. He seals this promise by giving humanity a rainbow, symbolizing this promise by God. And he makes it clear that his intent 
is to preserve the world as he unfolds his plan to rescue humanity through the offspring of a woman. That promise was given in Genesis 3. And then in Genesis 9 through 11, the evil of the world continues to build and it gets messy. And we are left wondering, how is God going to restore what was lost in Genesis 1 and 2? And he makes a covenant with someone named Abram. All right, he makes a covenant with Abram that takes place in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. This covenant is called the Abrahamic covenant. He promises Abraham, hey, Abraham, through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Remember the promise that we talked about in this series? Someone is coming. Someone is coming. Abraham, through you, someone is coming. Through your line, someone is coming that is going to bless the whole earth. And then when we get to Exodus, the descendants of Abraham have been enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt, and God hears their prayers of suffering and calls Moses to be his representative and to lead the people out of slavery and to freedom. And God takes him out of Egypt into the wilderness. Moses ascends a mountain and meets with God. And on that mountain, God promises to make Israel into a kingdom that will spread God's blessing and glory to all the nations. And God establishes his law and promises blessings if the people of God will follow these laws. This is known as the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant with Moses. And in that covenant, he, God encompassed the means by which humanity and God could be in fellowship. He establishes the law. He establishes the ark, right? And we talked about this last week. The ark pointed to the holiness of God, to the sinfulness of sin, but what else? Our need for the gospel. That it points to a blood sacrifice, this once and for all sacrifice that would cover our sins. And so in the covenant of Moses, you see the promise of Jesus. Someone is coming. Someone is coming. And then finally, you get to God's covenant with David, the Davidic covenant. He says, David, your kingdom shall be established forever. I kept thinking of the Sandlot. Forever, right? Your kingdom will be established forever, for eternity. Someone is coming. And as you go throughout the Old Testament, that promise that was given to David will appear over and over and over again. That everything from this moment in 2 Samuel, on, 2 Samuel 7 on, they all point back here and they say, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of his peace. There will be no end. And then what does it say? On the throne of David and over his kingdom. Isaiah 11 one, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. From the stump of Jesse, that's David. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he shall reign as king. Ezekiel 37, 24, my servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers live, they and their children, and their children's children, children's children shall dwell there forever, ever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Verse 27, my dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst for how long? Forever. So let me ask the obvious question. Ezekiel, when Ezekiel writes this, is David still alive? No, he's been dead for a very, very long time. So who is he talking about when he says my servant David, how will God's sanctuary be in their midst forever? Ezekiel says, hey, the house of David's coming. And through the house of David, God is going to dwell among you. And as the Old Testament closes, you see God's people clinging to a promise that was given all the way back in 2 Samuel 7, that one day a Messiah, an anointed one, was going to come from David's line and establish 
the king of God. And for 400 years, there was silence. God did not say a word. And they were waiting for an advent, for the coming of the Messiah, waiting for the Davidic king who was going to establish God's kingdom forever. And then finally, you get to the book of Matthew. And Matthew 1.1, it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of who? David, the son of Abraham. You ever noticed when the angel comes to Mary? Luke 1.26, listen to this encounter. I don't know if you've ever caught this. And the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city uh, of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But as usual, when an angel runs into you, you're like, ah! But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said, hey, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive him in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Look at verse 32. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob for how long? Forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. One more, just one more. Revelation 5, verse 1. At the end of all things, John says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who is seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. He has conquered so that he can open the scroll And at seven seals, Jesus, the king, the root of David, will be worshipped one day by every tribe and every language and every tongue and every nation. And the question is, okay, well, what happened between Acts and Revelation? The kingdom of God came because the king came, King Jesus. God with us, that he dwelt among us, he died, he rose from the grave, and now he is seated on the throne forever, that God did exactly what he said he was going to do. He blessed all the families of the earth, covenant with Abraham, fulfilled. Forgiveness came through that once and for all sacrifice, covenant with uh, Moses, fulfilled. And the kingdom of God was established forever through the root of David, covenant with David, fulfilled. And so the question for us that we have to ask, seeing the grand story of God, okay, Whose plan are we trying to accomplish in our lives? Ours or God's? The reality is some of us right now in this room are trying to build on our foundation. On our foundation. We're trying to build our lives on our own foundation and not on God's. You're trying to build a kingdom that's built on what you can do. A foundation that's built on what you think your family should look like. A kingdom that's built on what you think your finances should look like. A kingdom that's built on how you think others should see you. And all those things may not be bad things, but they're lesser than the plan of God. You want to build a house for God. You want to do good. And in order for you to build his house through you, his kingdom through you, God has to break your old foundation up. And some of you are feeling that right now. That he's got a sledgehammer. And he's destroying your foundation. But he's doing it so that he can build something new. And listen, it's going to be painful for a time. It might be the hardest thing you ever have to go through. I've been there. I don't say that with a naive spirit. I'll tell you all about it. The breaking up of the foundation that you built might be the hardest thing that ever happens in your life. But it will be the best thing that's ever happened in your life. You know what I think might be the hardest lesson for us to learn in this life? That your life is not about what you can give to God. It's not about what you can give to God. This life is about what God has given to us. The most difficult lesson for us to learn might be that we have nothing to give to God. 
That's hard. Because we want to earn things. That we are the receivers in this relationship. That he doesn't build on your foundation. We are built on his. And that cuts to every ounce of pride that we have. All right. So you might ask. Okay, Colton. Great. Great speech. But like, what do I do? You ever felt like that? Someone goes through this long thing. You're like, okay, okay, just tell me what I do. (laughs) What do you want me to do? Um, You're telling me that God's plan is better than my plan. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. His kingdom shall be established forever. But like, what do I do Like right now? Let me tell you two things. Two things that we should do. First, sit before the Lord and enjoy his grace. How should you respond to this? Sit before the Lord and enjoy his grace. Look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. After God has laid out his plan for David, what does David do? It says, then King David went in and sat before the Lord. He's got, God tells him, no, I'm, you're not building me a house. I'm building a kingdom. So David goes in and he sits before the Lord And he says, who am I? Oh, Lord God, what is my house that you have brought me thus far? This is King David. This is the king of Israel. And what does he do? He sits like a child before the Lord. He sees the grand plan of God. He hears about the grace of God. And he goes in and he just sits with his father. And he prays. And he worshiped, you know what David's experiencing here? Grace. It's that moment when you stop and you remember, I am nothing without the grace of the Lord. Think about it. Chapter 7 starts with David wanting to go and do for God. And it ends with David worshiping God and all that he's done for him. And that is the essence of the gospel. It's not that we go and do for God, but it's that we are filled with worship because of the great things that God has done for us. And it's not like David's going to go and do something bad. He just wanted to build a house. The tent looked shabby. And here's the mistake that David made. He thought that God needed him. He thought that God needed him. As if David's actions could make God a better God. As if having a better tent would make God a better God. And what I love about this moment is God lays out his plan He's making it clear, look, David, I don't need you, but that doesn't mean that I don't love you, and it doesn't mean that I don't have a plan. And as he lays this plan out, it's clear, just like Noah, just like Abraham, just like Moses, God did not choose David because of all the things that he could do for God. If he chose David on what David could accomplish, then this plan would, be, this plan would fail. God gives David a one-sided promise. And that means next week when David sins against Bathsheba and Uriah, it doesn't cancel out God's covenant with David. It means when David's kids fall deep into sin and David's family unravels, God does not cancel his covenant with David, which is the story of scripture. Israel, time and time again, runs from God. The people of God run from God, choose sin over and over. And not once in all of scripture does God say, I'm canceling my covenant with you. Not once. No matter how many times you run for God, there is not one time when God will say, I'm canceling my promises to you. It was not dependent on how well Noah and Abraham and Moses and David could perform. It was a one-sided promise. And the basis of that promise was God's own grace and glory. Here's what drove David to sit before the Lord and worship. He realized that God chose to love him and had moved his life forward way before he was capable to do anything for God. Scripture talks about, Ephesians talks about how we have been chosen before the foundation of the earth. That means before you ever read your Bible, God loved you and he chose you. Before you ever gave a tithe, he chose you. Before you ever thought that you had to earn the grace of God, he'd already given it to you. And you know what that does for us? It gives us the freedom to just sit before the Lord. Enjoy, without the pressure of performance. He didn't choose you because of what you have done or even the potential of what you could do. He chose you because in love he decided to. And now, 
as we worship and we serve and we move for the Lord, we do it out of joy and not out of fear because he might reject us. And so you might ask, okay, well, how do you know all this? How do you know all this to be true? How do we know that all these covenants have been fulfilled? How do we know that God did what he said he was going to do? How do we know that we haven't blessed through Abraham? How do we know that forgiveness has come? How do we know that David, David, the son of David now reigns forever? Let me read to you Hebrews 10, 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, for by a single offering he is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Do you see that? Stop making offerings for your sins. You're trying to accomplish what has already been done by Jesus. Verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that we can freely sit before the Lord with confidence by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So what should you do? The first thing I would say is just go and sit before the Lord and have peace with that. To worship, to just sit before him like a kid and just praise his name for all that he has done and all that he's going to do. What's the second thing that we should do? The second thing I would say is we should do what David does. Excel at the revealed things of God. When you're not sure what to do in life, when you're not sure what the right decision is, when you don't know what plans to make, set your eyes on the things that God has revealed to you. God has already revealed to you in his word what you should be doing. It's interesting, in 1 Samuel 22, that's what David does. That's what David does. Our 1 Chronicles 22, David says, God, I want to build you a house. God says, nope, I reject that plan. And so God tells him, it's not you that's going to build my house. It's your son, Solomon. So what does David do with that information? He excels at the revealed things of God. David goes on to make sure that Solomon has everything that he needs to build God's house. Look at 1 Chronicles 22, verse 3. It says, David also provided great quantities of iron for nails for the doors of the gates and for clamps, as well as bronze in quantities beyond weighing. Down in verse 5, for David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the And the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, of fame and glory throughout all lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. David hears the words of God and says, okay, I'm going to excel at what you have revealed to me. It's not me that's going to build a house, but you say it's my son. So I'm going to get the best wood. I'm going to get all the nails. I'm going to get the best Bronze, I'm going to make sure that my son has all that he needs, that he's equipped to fulfill the purposes of God. You don't know what God's plan is for your life, and that's okay. That's, a, that's okay. Excel at the revealed things that he's given you. Love him. Glorify him. Love people. Love your neighbor. Make disciples of all nations. Flee from your sin. Flee from it and run to him and sit before him as a gracious and good father. father. Put off the old and put on the new. And I promise, man, if you excel at the revealed things in in his word, then we will find peace in the things that are unknown. In those moments when we feel the weight, we look at the grand plan of God, what he has revealed to us, and we take a step back and we say, okay, I trust you. You are sovereign. You are good, and you are the king who sits on the throne forever. 